So, Customs is denying that they sent any planes out. They think it was a citation that was following uh, Drew Thornton, a citation jet. Um, and there's only a few custom pilots that were even certified to fly a citation jet. So, possibly one of them. Uh, chased him down, but even if they chased him, they would have to be, over, they were over him like 2,000 feet. So if you're chasing somebody and you're over them 2,000 feet, how do you get them to, um, I guess, jump out? What would provoke somebody to jump out like that? Uh, it seems highly probable that he meant for the Cessna plane to crash, or maybe he had set up the whole time for it to do it like that, or maybe he was killed beforehand and then put in the, to the plane. I don't know. And I don't know where his origin is. He was going to Knoxville, Tennessee, but I'm not sure where he was coming from. Was he actually coming straight from Columbia in the Cessna plane? Maybe, I guess. I don't know. I guess that that's, seems to be the, the assumption. So, and that's interesting that a Cessna plane could get into the United States from Columbia um, undetected, which is probably, I don't think, could happen today. And then there's sonar. Don't they have, like, sonar radar or something? I think they, they should be able to check flights. I know there's like stealth. We got like stealth technology. American government, at least not, not us. I don't have any technology. But American government's got stealth technology where you got low flying aircraft that can uh, stay undetected. But, okay, so you had a, a citation jet uh, who supposedly is over uh, Drew Thornton since that's the story, right? He was being chased by customs and he dropped, he, he jumped out of the plane. So, what reason would customs have for denying such a chase? Ralph had wondered, Ralph Ross, who is uh, Drew Thornton's nemesis, and seems like what most of the book is based on, at least his perspective, on Drew Thornton, who is not a good guy. Drew Thornton was a crappy guy. I mean, I guess it's it's kind of adventurous and fun that he, uh, you know, that he was trying to smuggle. <laughs> Uh, all that cocaine into America, uh, but his uh, he's got a sadistic rap sheet. He he liked karate. He would do karate against dogs. You know he would, he would karate uh, kick and uh, uh, I guess karate chop um, Fido and poodle dogs. And so would that explain why Drew's body had been mutilated from the top to the bottom when it was found in the old man's driveway? So he was mutilated. And why was he half dead during his fall? Um, interesting. So he's saying that there's he was mutilated from the top to bottom. So, I mean, you could have slammed on the concrete, but mutilated sounds like there was actual uh, worse damage. Had one of the pilots decided he'd teach the smuggler a lesson by whacking him with a wingtip? So a wingtip. So maybe a plane could have hit the, the wing, scared him. And so he jumped out, but why was his body mutilated? And it says, why was he half dead during the fall? How do you know if someone's half dead? Why was he, why did he have a heart attack, maybe? Why was he dead a heart attack? So Ralph Ross pulled out the autopsy report and the pathologist's findings, and he examined them once again. Drew's back was broken in two or three places. Seventy percent of the circumference of his aorta was lacerated. His pelvic area was separated by his abdomen by a gaping hole. Pelvic area was separated from his abdomen by a gaping hole. His chin and neck were full of bruises and abrasions. His teeth were fractured. Several of his ribs were broken and his spinal cord was torn. It sounded more like a man who had been run over by a Mack truck than an experienced skydiver who jumped out of an airplane with two chutes in perfect working order. Those who examined the corpse, Ralph learned, had speculated privately that perhaps Drew had not died in the scenario put forth and generally believed by the medical examiner. That the bag of cocaine knocked Drew, Drew semi-conscious, leaving him incapable of maneuvering. So what had happened? Had Drew been knocked across the chest by a chase plane? Had he been hit across the face by his own plane stabilizer? Why was he wearing expensive Italian shoes if he intended to jump? Was he killed on board and thrown out? One mystery, however, could be eliminated. That the body, indeed that of Drew Thornton, uh, it was his body. and It was not a double nor a convenient stiff. Uh, the Knoxville Police Department had matched the corpse's fingerprints to the FBI's prints of Drew. Ralph racked his brain for a plausible explanation of the circumstances. Although the DEA denied publicly that they had ever identified Drew's accomplice, Ralph knew that they had, and that the man was a Lexington bodybuilder and martial arts expert named Bill Leonard. 
So why hasn't Leonard ever been charged in the conspiracy? So Bill Leonard, Bill, <laughs> Bill Leonard is with Drew Thornton. He jumps out of the plane. He was supposed to give some cocaine to uh, Cowboy Caravan. Cowboy Caravan, uh, David Williams is uh, found dead. So Cowboy Williams, David Cowboy Williams is found dead. Uh, he was a runner. Drew Thornton is found dead. And Bill Leonard was the one that's right there in the middle of it all. And uh, Rebecca says she didn't uh, actually recognize the person um, which she could have been lying. I don't know if she was what Rebecca was thinking when she told her statement to the DEA. Uh, but she had mentioned that there was a, a person who told her about Drew's death and the bot's plan, but she said that she didn't know who the person was. She said that it was an anonymous source, so uh, a mysterious man coming out of the shadows or somebody she was protecting. That the bag of cocaine. Let's see, those who examined the corpse, Ralph learned, had speculated privately that perhaps did not, uh, di did not die in the scenario put forth. The scenario put forth by the male examiners at the bag of cocaine knocked Drew semi-conscious and leaving him incapable of maneuvering. So, he jumps out and the bag of cocaine hits him in the head and knocks him unconscious and he can't pull the ripcord. But his hand was on the ripcord. Mm hmm. So Rack, uh, Ralph is racking his brain for a plausible explanation of the circumstances. Why was Bill Leonard? Bill Leonard should have been charged in the conspiracy. You know, it says that the DEA knew about it. So Bill Leonard, why was Bill Leonard not charged for uh, anything? Anything involved in the death? Was he the snitch? Was he the one that had ratted uh, the other uh, uh, Drew out? And was he the person that was responsible for David Cowboy Williams' death? You know, anything's possible, right? So as a scientist, you got to leave an open mind and then uh, use the evidence to uh, see what happened, the, the, to paint a picture of what likely had happened. So why hadn't Leonard ever been charged in the conspiracy? The DEA in Knoxville had concluded that Drew had intended to throw the cocaine out of the airplane in designated areas to be retrieved by the ground crews and trucked back to Florida. But Ralph had problems with that theory, considering it too risky to drop millions of dollars of cocaine into national forest attached to parachutes. It seemed like a needle in the haystack. Maybe it uh, had indeed been a rip-off scheme in which Drew planned to throw the dope out in previously specified areas using remote bodies of waters and landmarks uh, to be picked up by his organization on the, on the ground, then skydive into safety while pretending to have died in the plane crash. Pretended to die. So it would have been an empty plane. I mean, wouldn't the plane been traced back to him? I don't know. And what about Cowboy Williams and the crash of the caravan? It seems strange that the feds had reneged on their original determination that the plane had been sabotaged. Was one agency protecting another government agency? Was Cowboy killed by Drew's people for failing to fulfill his obligations? Or by the Colombians for participating in the ripoff? Ralph suspected that Drew had not flown an empty plane to Columbia. He was much too shrewd to waste such an opportunity. Drew had probably taken a load of weapons south, for it was Ralph's conviction, having pursued Drew Thornton for nearly two decades, that he was a gunrunner first and a doper second. So, Ralph's conviction, he pursued Drew Thornton. Drew Thornton wasn't just a dope runner, but also a gunrunner. Um, it was clear to Ralph that Drew fancied himself an elite soldier in Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North's formerly secret war. If Ralph was right, then where had the guns gone? Why Was that why his smuggling escapade had not been pursued with vigor and why customs had denied any knowledge? So, carrying on. In the years that had transpired since his criminal conviction in 1982, Ralph Ross had finally grown comfortable with his new role as an unofficial advisor to the various law enforcement agencies whose investigations led them to Lexington unofficial advisor, so sort of like Monk off the TV show. Cool, good TV show. I like Monk. To the various law enforcement agencies whose investigations led him to Lexington. It had been at Ralph's urging that the FBI's supervision of the organized crime and narcotics squad in Lexington instigated a dogged pursuit of Henry Vance. In December 1986, FBI agent James Higgins had persuaded Bonnie Kelly to testify against Henry Vance. On January 2, 1987, Henry Vance was indicted by a grand, federal grand jury in the murder conspiracy of Florida prosecutor Eugene Berry. The indictment came just four days before the statute of limitations would expire. Ralph had felt a strong sense of personal satisfaction and completion when, on October 29th, 
1987, Vance was convicted and later sentenced to 15 years in a federal penitentiary. Vance's conviction and Drew's death were but a blip on the screen as far as a continuing uh, c a criminal conspiracy was concerned. Ralph knew that Drew's associate continued to operate at full force, perhaps with even more sophistication. Lexington remained a hotbed of drug smuggling and murderers. Drew's organization might have dissipated when it lost its most notorious member, but his enforcers were still roaming the territory, and plane loads of cocaine were landing regularly on Kentucky's remote airfields. The group was still favorite sons in the community, as evidenced by Henry Vance's inclusion in the 1989 edition of the Society Registry, Bluegrass Blue Book, but now with Bertram Gordon's detention in the Netherlands, Ralph saw the denouement of the dramatic odyssey that started in 1970 when Ralph Ross and Drew Thornton were thrust into conflict. He sensed that Gordon's arrest was a climax before the resolution. Finally, the promise of a just conclusion to years of bloody battles seemed imminent. Ralph saw the possibility of hitting the group at its core. He made plane reservations to Amsterdam, dug out his passport, and cleared his schedule. As soon as he received word that he would be granted an audience with Gordon, Ralph was ready to take off. Ralph actually felt excited that the, about the group's vulnerability. They had dismissed him as a threat years ago, but he was just gearing up for the final scene. Armed with the knowledge of Rebecca's statement and the identity and whereabouts of mystery man Bill Leonard, he knew he could convince the FBI and the U.S. Attorney of the need for a specially spe 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 convened federal grand jury to be seated in Lexington. DEA in Knoxville had just announced it had closed its investigation, so they couldn't claim an invasion of turf. Though Ralph had suspected it all along, now he had proof the smuggling conspiracy that resulted in Drew Thornton's death had been spawned and fulfilled in Lexington. The three main players, Drew, Rebecca, and Bill Leonard Lil lived in Lexington. Would it convince Ralph more than anything else that Rebecca Sharp was a more significant player than the little girlfriend keeping the home fires burning image she struggled to project was her statement. They know I would have them killed. She said they know I would have had them killed. So she's a player. Rebecca Sharp. Bill Leonard, who was never charged with anything. So the, the girlfriend was charged, but not Bill Leonard, who could be running around today. It's pretty strong stuff, he thought. Though his legal pad was full of questions for Gordon, there was only one to which he felt he absolutely must know the answer. Why had Drew Thornton taken the hit list on board his last flight? Had there been a contract let on the life of Ralph Ross? Had Drew taken the dossier with him to Columbia and hired cartel assassins to get the job done? Or had he taken it to Miami to be turned over to a mafia hitman? Had the contract been voided with Drew's death? Or was it still pending? unfinished business for one of Drew's foot soldiers. Despite his hope for a grand jury before which Rebecca, Leonard, Cobell, and Gordon would be called to testify, Ralph Ross's realism reminded him that anything could happen in the hands of bluegrass justice. On a personal level, Ralph was totally comfortable with his life. He had a thriving private investigations business, having teamed up with his longtime partner, Don Powers. Ross and Powers Associates charged a high hourly rate and served clients from around the United States. His bitterness had subsided, and he was now able to look at the decade's tragedies with a sense of irony and humor. He spent his free time trying everything he had ever fantasized about. He dated regularly and finally was a happy and free man. It had been a tumultuous and trying seven years since his felony conviction, and even a rocky four years since the death of his nemesis, Drew Thornton. But now he's back in the game. Ralph Ross knew he had survived intact when he realized that once again the chase was fun. Though he couldn't deny his subjectivity, he recognized the pursuit of Bertram Gordon for what it was, a game that he was winning, not a war that he had lost. So, um, acknowledgments of the book, Sally Denton. Sally Denton's The Bluegrass Conspiracy. Uh, there's many, many more chapters. I would say I probably read about 10% of it. Uh, the intro and the ending, so the conclusions and the... Uh, uh, you know, initial arguments put forth. But the specific details, which there seems to be way too many um, uh, open ties, loose ends. There's too many loose ends in the Bluegrass Conspiracy where you had uh, Drew Thornton, the second, who had died, and, and then two weeks later, Cowboy Williams had died in September. 1985. Sally didn't.
the bluegrass conspiracy.